Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. Good morning, North Greenville University. Wow, it is a, I've never been here before. This is my first time. And uh, I'm taken back to days in college. I went to Bible college up in Chicago, and uh, I remember being in the, in the band, and now it's just, it's just kind, of a, uh, kind of a nostalgic experience in a lot of ways. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself, and then we tell you kind of what I'm here to talk about. So uh, I grew up in the Chicago area, actually. Um, went to college in Chicago, uh, Moody Bible Institute. Uh, was a music major there. Any, any music majors out there? Okay. All right. Why aren't you practicing right now? Just all the time. All the time practicing, man. Um, anyway, yeah, I was a uh, voice actually there. So, um, so after college, um, just in, in tracing how God formed me over the years, uh, college was a real formative time. Um, got to witness a lot of poverty and a lot of addiction. This is right in downtown Chicago. Um, after that, I went to Uganda. I lived there for five months. I really recommend do something after college if you can because you're going to be tethered the rest of your life to something, you know, good things, family, kids, that kind of stuff. But um, that was really formative for me in seeing God's heart for the fatherless. Got to see a lot of the orphans, you know, in Uganda, living there, being among them that long. Um, I came back saying, oh, where's the, where are the fatherless around here, the physically and spiritually fatherless? Um, ended up moving down to Birmingham, Alabama to go to seminary. That's where I met my wife. We had our two kids there. We have two girls now, ages 9 and 11. And um, uh, started working in a lot of low-income areas there. Um, Ended up after that moving back to south side of Chicago to uh, work at a small church plant there. And this is in like the rough part of Chicago, you know, gunshots every night and that kind of stuff. But uh, it, was, it was really tough in a lot of ways. That's a whole long story. Um, but God really kind of broke me in a lot of ways. It was a tough place to go to, especially just right out of seminary. Um, so um, lasted between a year or two, and it just was not sustainable. So ended up moving to Greenville, South Carolina. That's where my wife is from. That was kind of like, okay, there's some family here at least. And just for kind of a fresh start, didn't have a job, didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, we just moved while we could still afford to move. And I um, uh, just kind of started healing. Um, you know, while in Chicago, uh, I was... Um, just coping in a lot of unhealthy ways. You know, we're all going to cope in some way. You're either going to cope in a healthy way or an unhealthy way, but everyone's going to cope. You cannot just go, 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 go. Um, so I coped in unhealthy, addictive ways. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, but um, came down to Greenville. What am I going to do? Um, was at a church that was really a good healing place for us. Um, about Five, a little over five years ago now, a job came open at the Greenville Rescue Mission, which is a part of Miracle Hill Ministries. Uh, maybe you've heard of Miracle Hill. Um, there's a men's shelter in Greenville, Greenville Rescue Mission. There's a women's shelter, a men's addiction recovery center called the Overcomer Center, where I currently work as the director. And then a women's version of that called Renewal, uh, Spartanburg Rescue Mission, Cherokee County Rescue Mission, and a bunch of amazing thrift stores around, uh, which maybe you've seen. But... Um, uh, you know, just started working as a counselor at the Greenville Rescue Mission. Just started working with men. Um, got to understand addiction a lot more from their perspective, but also as I continued to work out my own stuff in my own life in this area. Um, eventually, about two years ago, became director of the Overcomer Center. So um, I have worked a lot with addiction in my own life. I've worked a lot with men and their addictions in their lives. I've started recovery groups, uh, a couple different recovery groups around the area. And so, for some reason, this is just kind of what I've sort of fell into. So, uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about um, addiction. And as you're talking about mental health, um, addiction is major. Uh, addiction's a big deal. Um, I've been immersed in what, uh, like, a, what a biblically-based recovery process could look like. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. So, uh, I would like to just pray one more time, if you would, with me. Lord, we uh, want to hear from the voice of your spirit, from your word. And um, Lord, I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
So addiction, um, the effects of addiction are everywhere. Um, I doubt there's not a person in this room that is not touched by it in some way. Um, you can go online, look up the stats of the many thousands that have uh, literally died of some kind of an overdose. Um, this is something we hear about um, where I work uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, there are many who become severely mentally ill from drug abuse. Drugs mess you up. Uh, families have been destroyed. The amount of families, children that have been destroyed are, are numerous. It ends lives, ends careers. Uh, the many people incarcerated because of drugs, uh, people who give up everything for it. Um, and the thing is, it passes on from one generation to another. It doesn't just stop with one person. Uh, it, seems, it just seems to be one of these things like, yep, dad struggled, the children, their children, their children. When does it stop? Um, so it's easy. We, maybe we can talk about those people out there. Um, but uh, I do know that uh, most people in this room are very likely either toying with addiction or you yourself are deeply entrenched in some kind of addiction. Um, uh, I certainly was when I was out there. Um, if we just take addiction to pornography, for example, uh, it's at least a major struggle for probably over half the people in the room. Um, that's men and women, statistically. You know, for it's something that we can be real about and be honest about. So. I want you to turn to the person next to you and ask them right now, do you, I'm just kidding, don't do that. <laughs> Relax. Whew. Some of you were like, whoa, I don't know what's going on there. What's happening? No, don't do that. So, uh, so um, you know, addiction has many possible causes. Um, you know, there's our environments. Uh, many suffer from past trauma and abuse in different ways. There are genetic factors. Um, but here's the thing. The desire for a chemical uh, or for a rush of dopamine to the brain, which was what happens with, like, pornography or gambling and things like that, um, or an actual drug or alcohol, the desire for these things has its root in a God-given need or desire. We were built to need God, as we just sang, right? We were built to need certain things. Okay, and uh, the desire for these other experiences and these other things that we get addicted to are rooted actually in legit God-given needs. And now, they're, uh, they're a substitute. They're not real. They're fake, but they do promise that fulfillment that I'm wanting. Um, drugs affect us in many ways. They affect us physically. Uh, we begin to, de begin to depend on the thing in order to cope with real life. Um, you know, physically, uh, there are studies of the brain, of how this physically affects the brain, um, and how our brains become warped and transformed, we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, toward that particular uh, addiction. Uh, we're affected physically, we're affected emotionally. Uh, addiction isolates us from real connection. Uh, we were made to have real authentic connection, but, you know, whatever addiction it is can give us a sense of, like, I'm connected, I'm okay. We're, we're you know, this, this could be real, but... Uh, what it actually does is it cuts us off. Um, it cuts us off from feeling. Um, you know, uh, the rush of, of pleasure that comes from uh, an addictive substance or experience cuts us off from being able to appreciate normal things anymore. Mentally, it takes away our logic. We start not using the thinking part of the brain anymore, and we start operating off, off this feeling part of the brain. Um, and that's why you may have seen someone dealing with addiction that does really stupid things where you're looking like, how can they do that? It's not logical. Um, many guys we worked at the Overcomers, you know, they look back on what they have done and they're like, how could I do that? What was I thinking? And the answer is you weren't thinking, you know, um, you weren't. Um, our, our, the thinking part of our brain starts to not work properly. Spiritually, this is kind of the core of this, I believe. Spiritually, uh, it's nothing short of, of spiritual death. Um, uh, the core of this whole thing, I believe, is spiritual, and that's actually, I believe, where the good news is to be found. So we'll get to this in a minute. Um, so biblically, addiction. So the word, there's some English translations that at one point when it talks about wine uses the word, but it's not really a, a, a concept we find much of directly in Scripture as it's talked about today. But I do think the closest idea in Scripture we get to addiction is this idea of idolatry. Um, 
At its core, addiction is a worship problem. There are many other parts of it that are related to it, but at its core, I believe it's an addiction pro- it's, a, it's a worship problem. So let's think about uh, idolatry. You think, yeah, I don't do idols, you know, um, but let's go back to the Old Testament and look at, um, look at this for a minute. So even the worship of idols in the Old Testament was rooted in a God-given need and desire. They believed that these gods could save them in some way. Uh, when they felt fear, they felt insecurity, they felt circumstances that were beyond what they could handle, they began doing what we were all made to do in these circumstances, and that is to worship. Okay? We are all worshiping all the time. The question is, what are we worshiping? And so they were seeking rest, security, peace, all legitimate needs we all have. That's what they were seeking with these worship of idols. And they wanted something that they could control uh, to get a sense of control uh, from all the chaos that was happening around them. Um, they sought a God they could control. And idols were something they could control. They could construct it. They could make it. Um, and then they bow down to it. Um, we do the same thing, right? Um, be it a substance to numb the pain or something to relieve our stress, something that will give me a sense of feeling loved and accepted, something that will make me feel okay about all that is going on, all the loneliness, all the guilt, all the shame that I feel. We desperately seek relief, desperately need help from this. And um, in, our, in our fallen nature, it's so easy to turn to something that is right there, that is so easy, that is so accessible. You know, these days, it's right, it's right here on the phone if you're looking for it. Um, it's there. Um, the thing is I, about idols and the thing about addiction is... Uh, they're not free. They demand a price, and they demand a high price. They demand everything, actually. Um, the idols uh, of the Old Testament, you know, they, they may provide a sense of security, a sense of, like, everything's going to be okay. Uh, I may be valued, cared for in some way, but they demand your time, your energy, your attention, your health, your money. Um, in the Old Testament, people would, they would cut themselves, uh, out of their reverence and worship to these idols. They would sacrifice their children, literally, kill their children uh, for these idols. And nowadays we don't have uh, children sacrificed on altars, but how many children have been sacrificed on the altar of another's addiction? You know? And so it's, it's idol worship in a lot of different ways here. Um, so um, it's a worship problem. Um, So this is what I want to get across to you today, what I want you to remember. Um, We were designed to look like and be formed into the thing that we worship. Um, Greg Beal puts it this way. He says, we revere, uh, says we we, uh, resemble what we revere, either for ruin or restoration. It's a good alliteration there. We resemble what we revere, either for ruin or restoration. Um, We become like what we worship. Um, another guy who's written on this, James K. Smith, wrote a book called You, you Are What You Love. Um, just a couple of resources for these kinds of ideas. But let's unpack this a little bit. We begin to resemble and to be formed into the image and look like the thing we worship, and that goes for good or for bad. So let's look at a, a few texts for this. I'm going to go to Psalm 115, uh, a few verses from here. So Psalm 115, starting in verse 4. Uh, the Bible uh, makes fun of idols quite a bit, um, just kind of makes, makes a joke of how ridiculous they are. Uh, so this is one of those texts. It says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throats. Those who make them will become like them. So do all who trust in them. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. So um, look at this. Uh, You know, we have a lot of guys who come into the Overcomer Center, and uh, they have ears. Nothing wrong with their hearing, but spiritually deaf. They have eyes, but uh, spiritually blind. Um, A lot of times they know it. That's why they come in the door for help. Um, you know, they, they can feel, um, but in many ways, they're, they're just walking shells, uh, unfeeling. 
Um, and that's what idolatry, that's what addiction does. They have, they have simply done, they, they've become like the thing they've been worshiping. Um, Jeremiah 2 has a similar phrase. It says, they went after emptiness and became empty. They went after emptiness and became empty. Um, so um, take uh, pornography, for example. This provides a false sense of intimacy. So it's fake. It gives a sense that I'm okay, everything's okay, all the stuff that's weighing on me, all the exams and all the pressures and all the, you know, the, the financial issues and the relational issues. Uh, it makes it seem like everything is okay for a moment, but it's fake. It provides a false sense of intimacy. And uh, when we go after fake intimacy, we become incapable of real intimacy. Okay, so going after false intimacy, I now become fake. I now become incapable of real intimacy. We become like what we worship. And um, as I look out at this group here, I can't help but be reminded of when I was in college, I was headed into ministry. I had to be spiritual. I had to act spiritual in many ways. Um, I really made a God out of what other people thought of me. I was insecure, fearful. No one could tell this from the outside, of course. I uh, wanted to be made much of. I really idolized myself. And as I reflect on it, um, I grew spiritually in a lot of ways, sure, but I also used God and religion as a means of getting others to accept me. And uh, this brought a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety. Um, I had God-given need for love, for acceptance, for this emotional intimacy, for real connection, to be known and to be real, all legitimate God-given needs and desires. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, but for me, I turned to pornography for my relief. Uh, but it was all fake. It was false and it was empty. And then I became fake. All that became fake. And so we become like what we worship. Maybe some of you can identify with this. So what we do and what we worship certainly affects, you know, we say what you do affects other people. Very true. But it also affects us. Uh, every decision we make, everything we are exposed to, Everything we worship and love has an effect on our brain on a neuro neurological level. Um, scientists have studied this. It actually becomes uh, wired or conformed to that thing. Uh, the brain itself begins to change and morph. And, y'all, our brains were designed this way by God. Um, it conforms to the thing we worship even on a, a physical level. So uh, uh, someone mentioned Romans 12, uh, 12 to do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, right? I don't think Paul knew about neurochemistry, but like, uh, don't be conformed. Like our, our, we, were, we were designed, you know, we're not just spiritual people and then we have the physical part of us and all these different parts of us. We're much more integrated than I think we realize. And so we're physically affected, we're emotionally affected, we're spiritually affected, cognitively affected in so many different ways by the decisions we make, and especially by the things that we love and the things that we worship. So, that may sound depressing so far, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the good news now, is what do we do? What's the solution? Well, how do I, how do I get free of this? You're probably sitting there, and you, some of you uh, may be wondering, okay, I, I'm messed up. I know this. Uh, my brain's messed up, but I'm stuck. I'm caught. Maybe you know someone else who's in this situation. What do we do? What's the solution? And there are, there are no uh, one-size-fits-all answers to this question, uh, but I am going to suggest a biblical kind of path through this. Um, here's the thing. You're going to need some help for it from others. You're going to have to get honest about what's going on. Um, you will probably need some counseling. I know counseling is offered here. Uh, counseling is available. You're going to have to tell somebody. I wish there was a way around it. There just is not. Um, you may have to get some help from a mental health standpoint. A lot of addictive behaviors are, are, are a cover-up for a legit mental health condition uh, that may require professional help. Um, um, but uh, there's also spiritual warfare taking place. You know, changing your life and changing a long pattern of behavior is probably the hardest thing you will ever do. Um, so how do we do it? Um, well, just as we transform negatively into the image of our idols and addictions to our own destruction, the good news is that we can also be transformed by reorienting the focus and practice of our worship toward the one true God. Okay, it goes both ways. And you can change. Spiritually, you change. 
and that will actually begin to change you physically. That's how kind of integrated we are. Um, I see um, men at the Overcomers, it's a seven month residential program. You're living there for seven months. Um, and I see guys when they first come in, we take a picture of them uh, just kind of for our records. And uh, by the time they get to that end, the transformation is visible. It is physical, it is behavioral, it's, it's amazing transformation. And this is the work that God does. God is in the business, business of changing hearts and lives. So how do we do it? Um, how do we begin this process of change? Well, y'all, it starts with the gospel. Um, should not be a surprise to you. What I mean is that believing that God, because of the work of Christ, accepts me and loves me at my worst. Right now, in your worst moment, in the moment when you're, you're doing that behavior, doing that thing, God is loving you. Not after you clean yourself up. If you think, I gotta, I gotta have some good days, I gotta clean myself up first, then I can start this process. Then God will accept me. It does not work that way. It's not after you've begun to deserve it. It's not after you've had a good day. That's what we're like. We tend to think, I gotta prove myself a little bit. That's how you and I think, but God is not like us. His ways are higher than our ways. God waits and longs to show compassion to you in your worst moment. Right there at the worst place of the rock bottom moment when you feel, I'm beyond the grace of God. Often we put God's grace in this box called, I have to deserve it. That's kind of the box of it. Um, and that is not a box that God lives in. Um, he loves to show compassion. It's, his very, it's the very nature of Jesus to reach out and be close to the worst of sinners. Um, if you treat grace like something you have to deserve, you're still trying to control God. And a God you can, you can control is nothing but another idol. All right? Ephesians 2. It is not your doing. It is a gift of God. Do you believe this? Do you understand this? It is not your doing. It is a gift of God. Once we stand before God and feel the closeness and the embrace of the true God who loves us as we are and not as we should be, that's where true worship begins to be transformed. That's where, true, where we can truly worship him. True worship involves adoration of God, submission to him, continual repentance, obedience. Um, when we worship, we're seeking an encounter with the risen Christ. Did you know that every time you come to God and worship, um, our, our goal ought to be to have an encounter with the risen Christ every time, not just on these moments, not just even in when there's a band on or whatever. It's every time, every time we have an encounter with God, all the time. And as we are looking at God, we are being transformed every time. If you worship this morning, you were changed. You were changed a little bit. You, didn't, you should not walk out here out the same. You may not be able to perceive it or feel it, but it's happening. So um, let me go to a text that kind of talks about how this positive change uh, looks here. So we want to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 18. This is amazing. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 3. It says, We all, with unveiled face, beholding, looking at, the glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? It's the essence of who God is in his person and character most clearly and powerfully seen in Jesus Christ. This is the glory of God. So with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. You see that? So as we look at glory, as we behold this glory, we are being transformed into that same glory. And it says from one degree of glory to another, glory to glory. So as we look and as we behold, this is what the Christian life is. And uh, I want to suggest that this is a key way that we begin to reorient, reorient our hearts to worship the true God and begin to get free of addiction. All right? Um, you know, we have several instances in the Old Testament of people uh, who, you know, they've, they've been looking at idols and they're returning to God. One of the first steps in, the, in this process was repentance. So the first step, y'all, is to admit the reality of what has happened. Admit the reality of, of what you become, what you have done. Um, 
probably the hardest step is just getting honest with yourself about what's going on. Not, not beat yourself up. Just get honest about this is what's going on. This is what I've done. This is where I've sunk to. This is the, the power I've given up. Um, get honest with God, and yes, you have to get honest with somebody else. There's no getting around that. Um, many of the great revivals in the Old Testament and throughout history um, have been actually accompanied by um, starting with public confession of sin. Um, you got to talk to somebody about it. Um, so, you know, one guide to this process of kind of getting free is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the 12 Steps, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I think they're very helpful. Um, but they kind of actually are a guide through this. So steps one through three talk about, one is just admitting, step one. Steps two and three talk about um, my relationship with God, okay? Um, and ends with, I've made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. You've got to get this relationship right first. Um, steps four through six deal with uh, myself, uh, the relationship with myself. That's where I do this big house cleaning. This, uh, it's called a fearless moral inventory. And where I look at, look at um, my sins, you know, they would call them my character defects, these different things, and uh, begin to pull those things out of the closet. You've been throwing them in for years and years and years and give them up to God. Um, but the overcomers, we have them, we, uh, the guys write them down and they, they burn them, um, you know, and put them, put them to the cross. Um, step seven through nine deal with my relationships with people because we don't exist in a vacuum and our behavior and our, the underlying Things there have actually hurt a lot of people. And then steps 10 through 12 is sort of this ongoing process where I continue to repent. Um, I continue to draw close to God in a conscious way on a daily basis, and I continue to reach out and help others who are struggling. Um, it sounds like discipleship, Christian discipleship in a lot of ways. Um, but our, our destiny, what we were made to do, is that throughout the day, when we rise from sleep, our lives would be characterized by conscious worship. So this is in our work, in our play, in our conversations that we, we more and more and very often look at Jesus Christ. So John 15, uh, Jesus used this language, abide in me, you know, remain in me, live in me, draw your life source from me, that we'd stay vitally connected to Jesus. So um, this does not just mean, I'm not just saying, hey, y'all, do your, your quiet times in the morning, you know, be real consistent with that. Yes, you should do that too. Um, yes, you should come to, come to uh, church, come to worship, um, do these things. Um, but I think there is, a, there is a, a level of worship that we were made to live in that is much more often, much more regular. And what we're talking about here is a life where your routines and practices become a liturgy. Okay? So don't be scared of that word liturgy. Uh, it just simply means the order of worship. So at, at wherever church you go to, it might be we do the announcements, and then they do the songs, and then they preach, and then, you know, we're done. Um, you know, take up an offering, probably shit in there somewhere, you know. But, like, that's a liturgy. Some churches have much more fuller types of liturgies, but that's Sunday morning. Would this liturgy spill over into your life so your routines actually become acts of worship that you do every day on a regular basis? Um, look to Jesus. Look to him each moment. So, um, I was talking to my wife about, I was just talking about what I was going to talk to you all about. And she's like, what, what do you mean conscious worship throughout the day? I have to, I have to you know, like y'all are writing papers. Y'all are doing class. Y'all have stuff to do. I have to work a job. We have to do things where we're not always praying or always doing this. What does this look like? So um, a couple passages I want to look at real quick just as I, uh, as I close here. So uh, Deuteronomy 6. So this is where, uh, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Listen to this. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk with them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So sort of like this ought to be the subject of your life throughout the day during regular everyday activities, okay? When you're walking around, you know, when you're going from here to there, when you're eating, when you're doing these normal things. Um, we see Paul talking about this. He says, give thanks in all things. Pray without ceasing. We see this uh, all the time. The Psalms, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. That's, that's pretty much all the time. Um, 
Repentance is something Martin Luther said, repentance ought to be as normal and natural to the Christian as breathing. You know, we breathe out our repentance. We breathe in God's grace. This ought to be uh, a very common thing. So when you are walking out of here, the normal things we see, would these become, how do we make these acts of worship? So um, a few good resources on this. Um, so I got this thing called Every Moment Holy. Have you all seen this? So um, it just talks about every moment of our lives becoming an act of worship. And it has these little prayers in them. So there's a couple. There's one on, like, for example, when you're changing a diaper. You know, there's a liturgy for changing the diaper. Did you know this? It's true. It's in the book. Um, and there's all kinds of things like that. You don't have to use this, but uh, it's serious, actually. Um, so here's one for... Um, Upon tasting a pleasurable food, it says, For the infinite variety of your creative expression, I praise you, O God. You have made even the necessary act of eating a nurturing comfort and perpetual delight. You can use your own words for this. Um, here's one. Upon observing a tree swaying in the wind. Pretty common, right? Um, o Spirit of God who moves in mystery unseen, so move now in my heart. Would we see these common everyday things that we do and reorient our lives toward the worship of God? And as we do things every moment, every time, we actually begin to transform into a greater glory. We began to look more like Jesus. So close with this. Um, our great hope one day is that we will one day be fully like him. So 1 John 3.2 says, When he appears, we shall be like him. How are we going to be like him? What is the thing that, that's going to happen that's going to make us transform like him? It says, when he appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when we see clearly, we will be finally and fully transformed. And I cannot wait for that day. And every moment ought to be a moment of longing and hope. The next verse after that says, everyone who thus um, hopes purifies himself as he is pure. So we become pure as he is pure as we hope. Um, so do you see this theme? As we look to him and behold him, we are transformed. So don't make that just times when you're up here in chapel, when you have, you know, most of your life is going to be very ordinary times, okay? It's not going to be just exciting here and there. And we go from exciting experience to this, like you can't depend upon that. For the sustenance of your spiritual life, a lot of it is actually very ordinary, okay? Um, but even the ordinary moments ought to be acts of worship, times of worship. Um, so um, why don't you all, uh, why don't you bow your heads? I want to pray, and I want you to pray with me. Um, so I want to ask you, if you're uh, struggling with addiction, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. Uh, if you are um, sitting there and you're saying, you know, I, I want to start this journey, are you ready to start the journey? Are you ready to become free? Well, it starts with admitting. So um, first of all, in the quietness of the moment, I just want you to admit to yourself. This may be the hardest thing. Admit to yourself what's really going on. Stop justifying yourself. Stop the excuses. Admit to yourself, I have a problem. It's too much for me. I can't do it alone. I'm, I'm dying inside. I cannot hold up the strain anymore of living this double life. Um, next, I want you to um, uh, admit it to God. God, we, uh, we come before you now, and there are many here who are struggling, who have never really gotten honest about this, and maybe they have only uh, been honest on a certain level, um, but this is where it starts, Lord. And so um, we want to admit to you, Lord, each one of us here, that we do struggle and that these temptations are too much for us, and we can't do it alone. And we have worshipped idols for a very long time. And they have taken so much from us. And we want to say, no more, God. No more. And, uh, Lord, we want to um, open our hands and open our hearts and just submit to you right now and admit to you what's going on. Would you just take a moment and, and admit this to God right now? Lastly, um, I want you to make a commitment that um, if, and if you've done those first two things, admitted to God and to yourself, um, this is the next step that follows. It takes, courage, it takes some courage, but you've got to tell someone else. Um, there are counselors here. 
Um, there are good friends here. You have pastors. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I want you to commit in your heart right now that uh, you're going to tell someone and you're going to begin this process of getting free. Uh, so, Lord, we come to you, all of us now, and we ask that you would make today and going forward uh, a life of worship, a life where we look to you in our greatest needs, where we cry out to you in our times of fear and stress and trouble, Lord, where we will not do this alone. And, Lord, as we do this and as we behold you, would you transform us and mold us that we would more and more be like Jesus and God. We long for the day when we will fully and finally be in, uh, in your image, and we will look like you. We will clearly mirror that glory that you meant us to mirror. And, Lord, we thank you for this, and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all for having me. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. 